Hello everyone, welcome again to Biofluid Mechanics and this is uh, lecture 21 and today we're going to be uh, changing things a little bit when it comes to uh, driving the circuit, the cardiovascular circuit. So, so far we have been driving every one of our circuits, whether it is a single uh, resistance or resistance inductance RL circuit or resistance inductance and uh, compliance RLC circuit, even with the new element of the valve that we, uh, that we uh, introduced last week. Uh, we have been driving the circuits with a voltage or pressure generation generator, which is a pump essentially. So we've been driving the circuit with a with a very with essentially a battery that introduces a pressure signal that we have been making a function of time to simulate a sinusoidal wave to therefore make an analogy of what the ventricle would do in a cardiovascular circuit. I've mentioned in the past that. Uh, um, ventricles uh, do not necessarily, what well, we know that, they don't produce a signal that is perfectly sinusoidal. In fact, the signal that they produce, a pressure signal, actually goes up very quickly for about a third of the cycle, and then it comes down very quickly and then stays flat for about two-thirds of the cycle. So systole, uh, it goes up, and then during diastole, it goes down and rests for about two-thirds of the cycle, depending on the level of activity. You know, the, the, the faster the heart beats, uh, the more of the cycle is occupied by systole and the more you're at rest uh, uh, the the more the cycle is occupied by diastole so the one third two third ratio is usually is usually um, standard for a normal level of activity so that doesn't look at all as a sinusoidal wave but uh, with the sinusoidal wave uh, that we've been using or variants of that using an exponential and so on we have been able to illustrate how this analogy of an electric circuit works in the hydrodynamic circuit of the cardiovascular circuit. Um, but today we're going to introduce an alternative to that, a way to not only uh, simulate a signal that is not necessarily sinusoidal and looks uh, closer to what the actual ventricular signal will look like, but it's also a signal that is not necessarily directly a pressure signal. Because think about this, uh, the the heart is, is not a, a continuous flow pump or, a, or an alternative flow pump or any type of pump that receives a constant signal, then it produces some, some sort of time variable signal. The signal that the, that the heart produces depends entirely on the, on the load it receives before it goes to the ventricle or the, the amount of blood that it receives and the pressure of that blood. So it, 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 it depends a lot on the baseline. So depending on what the blood is and, and, and the atrium before it actually goes into the ventricle, and depending also on what type of resistance it sees up front, it will produce a certain pressure. So unlike the pumps that we have been using, which will just simply produce a pressure, no matter what, the pressure signal, the ventricle actually generates an amount of energy. And that energy will translate into pressure depending on what it sees in front of it. If there's too much resistance, resistance it might translate into a lot of pressure if the flow actually if the, if the cardiovascular flow uh, f uh, fluid flows freely then it actually can translate into lower pressure the same amount of energy can translate into more flow rate and less pressure or more pressure and less flow rate it's a kind of a balance between the two so uh, using a pressure generator a battery a uh, voltage generator is not necessarily the uh, most accurate way uh, not only because of the shape of the signal, but also because of how the signal itself uh, is, is uh, it manifests. Uh, so what we're going to present today is an alternative to that. So instead, we're going to be driving the circuit instead of using a pump. We're going to be using a compliance, a capacitor. But it's a capacitor that is very special. It's a capacitor that has a time varying compliance. It's a compliance that we can actually tailor fit or ta ta tailor make and curve fit to, to be similar to what the actual heart produces. Um, and then the pressure response will actually be a consequence of that time varying compliant in the, in the cardiovascular circle. So let's look at the notes and, and, and formulate this. So this is uh, the biofluid mechanics. This will be lecture number 21. 
So as I said, up until now, we have been driving our cardiovascular hydrodynamic circuits with time bearing, I'm going to call it pressure generators. And that is what we have something that looks like a pump in an electric circuit. It will just be a battery or a voltage source. And that voltage source is simply a pressure gain delta P of the pump. And then there's a particular Q that flows through the pump as a result. Well, and as a result of these and as a result of whatever it sees around. But the pressure signal will be maintained at the outlet of the pump because it's induced directly by the pump. An alternative more accurate approach is to simulate the ventricular pumping using a time bearing time bearing capacitor. So that is, so instead of having a pressure generator or a pump, what we'll have is, well, within the circuit, we have a node that uh, represents the pressure at the left ventricle. And attached to that node, we'll have the compliance of the left ventricle the capacitance of the left ventricle, same thing. But one particular aspect about this capacitance or compliance is that it's time bearing. So that arrow, that cross arrow, actually means that this CLV is actually a function of time. Yeah. As a result, we'll have Q going in or out of the left ventricle, depending, of course, on Faraday's law. And Faraday's law states very simply, and we've seen this equation many, many times, that the derivative with respect to time of the capacitor times the pressure at the node should be equal to the flow absorbed or released by the capacitor. Okay, so, well, in our previous uh, formulations, obviously every single one of the capacitors that we've used in our circuits is a constant capacitor. So this constant capacitor comes out of the derivative. It's just basically C times dP dt is equal to Q, which basically states if the pressure is increasing, this time rate of change of pressure is positive and the Q will be positive, meaning going into the capacitor. If the pressure is actually decreasing, the time rate of change is negative and therefore the Q actually goes in the opposite direction out of the capacitor back into the circuit. But now that it's no longer entirely true because you have the capacitor actually multiplying POV. You cannot just directly take it out, right? So the approach will be now, well, how do we, how do we deal with this equation and the state system of equations? This is a new equation that we'll have to, uh, that we'll have to introduce into the formulation along with the, the use of the uh, Kirchhoff current law and the Kirchhoff uh, voltage law so that we can simplify those equations and end up with as many equations as we have state variables. So basically we can apply chain rule here and say this is CLV. And again, LV stands for left ventricle, but these same equation can be applied to any other time bearing compliance. In fact, the right ventricle can also be a, can also be a illustrator or, 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 basically formulated as a time bearing compliance same exact way but as you will see next class we'll be concentrating on the left ventricle and this is what we'll use to actually drive the entire circuit so if we apply chain rule here we'll see that this is 
Um, how it goes. Right. So basically, if we isolate the derivative, we'll notice that the new state equation looks like like this. plus 1 over CV, CLV, T times Q of LV, which will later actually eliminate using Kirchhoff current law. But this is a new state equation for that particular state variable, the L, P, P, uh, pressure of the left ventricle. And as you can see, now it's not only a function of the flow going into that, uh, going in and out of that node, but it's also a function of how the, the uh, compliance actually changes as a function of time, times the inverse of the compliance itself uh, and the pressure. Now, recall that the compliance or capacitance is defined as the ratio uh, volume change to pressure. So it is essentially the volume of the left ventricle minus some reference initial volume, the volume at zero load, that is, divided by the pressure of the left ventricle. This is how the compliance or any compliance is actually defined. It just happens that for most applications, this number turns out to be a constant because the time uh, dependency of the numerator cancels with the time dependency of the denominator. But it just turns out that for the case of the ventricle, that is not the case. More importantly, these are quantities that can actually be measured. So it is it becomes very convenient to represent the ventricle in this particular way and use this to actually illustrate the ventricle and model the ventricle in the cardiovascular circuit uh, because these quantities can actually be very easily gathered from from even something as simple as an electrocardiogram. Therefore, if the volume of the, lab, the left ventricle and the pressure of the left ventricle are measured, the time varying compliance of the left ventricle can be directly computed, can be directly computed. Okay, so that's easier than trying to find a pump signal that represents the ventricle. We just use some imaging find how the, what the ventricle is doing, some catheter data, look at the pressure coming out of the ventricle, take the ratio of the two, and we have the compliance. So the volume of the left ventricle can be measured through other imaging techniques. Something such as a a 4D CT scan, so computerized tomography, and 4D standing for position and time, uh, three slices of position and time, so you can take time slices of images in the in CT scan, and therefore we can actually directly measure the volume of the, of the ventricle. The pressure on the left ventricle can be measured through catheterization. This simple catheter introduced into the ventricle via femoral artery or 
or by other means. So this actually makes it simple, but at the same time makes it onerous because you have to get, if you want to know what the compliance of the left ventricle is for a specific patient, if you want to do this in a person specific manner, because every person has a completely different or slightly different compliance, especially if the person is not healthy, especially if there's a heart lesion or congestive disease, this compliance actually changes significantly. So if you want to know, you have to catheterize the patient and you also have to um, put the patient through imaging uh, imaging machines to so they can actually measure the the uh, these quantities. So there's an alternative to this. Let me go to the next page, and the alternative is a lot simpler. However, CLV of T can be directly or actually indirectly computed this will be the direct way through PLV and VLV but it can be indirectly computed through secondary parameters easily measurable through EKGs. So a trained technician or cardiologist can actually look at an EKG and extract some parameters that can be useful to indirectly calculating this compliance. In particular, these are the what are or known as the maximum elastance something called Emax and minimum you need mum elastance something called Emin well, these two parameters actually we discussed these parameters when we uh, when we introduced the cardiovascular function uh, physiology and function uh, but now that will be useful to actually put numbers to this model Okay, so why elastance and not compliance? Well, remember that the elastance, the real stage, of the left ventricle, that's E of the left ventricle as a function of time, is related to the compliance of the left ventricle as simply is reciprocal. So the elastance and not just of the left ventricle of any capacitor or compliance is the inverse or reciprocal of the compliance. Elastance is the inverse of the compliance and by definition it's just PLV divided by the volume of the left ventricle minus some reference volume. So the units of elastance are exactly the inverse of the units of compliance. Millimeters of mercury divided by milliliters. Okay. Well, that doesn't help us much because again, we are trying to avoid having to calculate, having to find this ratio of pressure and volume because for that we need imaging techniques and catheterization. So instead we're going to try to use these two parameters, Emax and Emin. So again, elastance is the inverse of compliance. Okay. Now, these two parameters here, E max and E min, can be used to normalize the elastance of the left ventricle. So the elastance of the left ventricle, ELV, can be normalized as the compliance of the left ventricle is this 
E max minus E min times some normalized elastin function plus E min. Okay, so these two quantities can be used in this particular way. To essentially denote that if you if you have a, a curve fit or a function that simulates the shape of it and it's normalized from zero to one, you can use this value C max and E min to actually scale that up to the maximum value of that particular person found in the EKG and the minimum value of that particular person found in the EKG. It's very simple. So, and by the way, this can also be in, include a normalized time, Tn. So not only you can normalize the shape of the curve from zero to one, but you can also normalize the time to a non-dimensional time parameter so that this actually works for any heart rate. So if the person is actually uh, the heart beating at 60 beats per minute, this will work. And if it's beating at 120 beats per minute, this will also work because this will expand and contract the time scale uh, proportionally. So EN is what's called the normalized elastance. Well, TN is normalized time scale. Again, normalized elastance is something that has units of one, no units. And normalized time scale is something that has units of one. Okay, so you just basically work in a scale of zero to one to produce a normalized elastance, and also another scale of zero to one to, pro to produce a normalized time scale. So essentially, the way it goes, so you can see this is a very clever approach that has already some time. It's been around for some time from, since the 90s. And uh, it has been key to uh, effectively and accurately modeling this cardiovascular circuits. So basically, we need a function that does this. Right? Uh, we need a function that goes from 0 to 1 that actually goes up very quickly, then it goes down, and then it stays. And this is the scale Tn that goes also from zero to one. Right, so we need this, uh, this particular curve, and this is En as a function of Tn, right? Now, how long of these will be occupied by systole and how much of it will be occupied by diastole? As I said, well, in normal circumstances, this will be about uh, one third of cycle, and this will be about two thirds of the cycle. But whatever normalization curve we use has to be capable of adapting that so that when the heart rate goes up, these ratios more than one third and this ratio is less than two thirds, right? So somehow the um, the curve that we come up with, and this is a, an, again, a made up curve, it's a, what's called a curve fit of data that we have obtained through catheterization and that we're using to normalize using data or parameters that we obtain from simple uh, uh, measuring techniques like an EKG. All right. So what are the values of Emax and Emin normally? So Emax is approximately two millimeters of mercury per milliliter for healthy adults. E max is approximately 0 0.5 millimeters of mercury per milliliters for heavily congested ventricle left ventricle. So it can go anywhere between 0 0.5 and 2. If it's 0 0.5, you're in, the person is in really, really bad shape. So that, that information can actually be gathered from an EKG. So this is a range, anywhere from 0 0.5 to 2. And it actually scales very, very accurately. Okay. Uh, the EMIN, on the other hand, is usually about 0 0.06 millimeters of mercury per milliliter for everyone okay so that number actually doesn't change very much so we'll keep it at 0 0.06 so 
there are many functional representations and curvets for the normalized elastance E sub n. The most common form is due to somebody called Stergiopoulos. Stergiopoulos. And uh, the publication, the original publication, has some co authors, and it's from 1996. Okay. And it's known as the double hill function. So, Stergiopoulos is a, is a researcher and engineer uh, at the ETH, is a university in Switzerland. And him, along with his, with his colleagues, actually um, gave this function a form. And through major curve fitting and statistical regression, they were able to manufacture this particular function. It is 1.55, and don't read anything physical out of these numbers. These are just curve fits, meaning these are numbers that were actually tuned to produce exactly what they saw on patient information. So it's one plus Tn divided by 0 0.7 to the power of 1.9 times one divided by one plus Tn divided by 1.17 to the power of 21.9. Okay, it looks like a very strange formula, and indeed it is a very strange formula because it has absolutely no physical relevance. Again, it's a curve fit. They decided to try different forms, different exponents, different powers, different ratios, different um, bases. And they uh, did what's called a numerical regression or curve fit until they actually got these coefficients to match almost perfectly what they were looking for. So this function looks like this. And this produces a curve that looks like this. It goes from 0 to 1. It dies down and stays flat. As a function of a normalized time that goes from 0 to 1 as well, that we can actually denormalize with an actual heart rate. Again, if, for example, the heart rate of the person is 16, that means that the time, the, the cycle of the, the heart cycle is exactly one second. If the person's heart rate is 120, that means that the heart cycle is exactly 0 0.5 seconds and so on. So this is denormalized that way. And the elastance is denormalized by the use of Emax and Emin. So it's actually scaled up to Emax depending on the value of it, and E min, depending on the value of it. So, the normalized time scale Tn is defined as Tn is equal to T divided by T max. This, where t is at the actual time, physical time, such that t is the physical time in seconds, and t max is the shifted heart cycle period also in seconds
But remember, period is the duration of something, in the case of the heart cycle. If the heart rate is 60, then the heart cycle period is uh, one second. However, this is a shifted one. So T max is equal to 0 0.2 seconds plus 0 0.15 TC, where TC is the actual heart cycle, or it's the actual heart cycle period. Such that TC is the actual heart cycle, there's an R here, period, in seconds. Well, that one's very easy to calculate. It's simply 60 divided by the heart rate in seconds. So here's all the information we have to actually mo to actually model the uh, left ventricular function of any person whose Emax and Emin parameters we can actually gather from EKG data or information. So again, the values of Emax and Emin may be inferred from EKG data. Remember when we studied left ventricular function, we had something called the ESPVR, oops, so ESPVR. That's the same thing as Emax. This is the end systolic pressure, volume, relationship. If you go back to our first few lectures, you'll find in those presentations that we define ESPVR and we actually pointed at how to find it from catheterized data. And EMIN is the EDPVR, this is the end diastolic pressure, volume, relationship. Right? So that's where the information comes from. And that's the actual denomination in, uh, in physiological terms. Now the elastin function may be scaled so a scale value of the elastin function can be a delta of e of the left ventricle okay and the delta just basically a number from zero to one representing whether a person is sick or representing whether it's a is an infant, uh, so or representing essentially the right ventricle. The right ventricle can actually be a shifted value. I'm sorry, a scaled down value of the left ventricular elastance. Remember that the right ventricle is is uh, less powerful than the left ventricle, and but it can actually be proportionally modeled from the formulation of the left ventricle through this parameter delta, which is essentially just a scaling parameter. So we can try all this. Let's test it on on MathCat. We're very um, a simple spreadsheet that I put together and we'll share with you on, on Canvas where we can actually uh, use this formula, program this formula. So it's again a very weird looking formula, but it's intended to be that way. Again, don't read anything into these values of 1.9 and 21.9, 1.17. Those are just fine tuned parameters to actually make this function look or do what it's supposed to do. All right. There's no physical meaning behind this. This is a function that goes from zero to one using a scale value that goes also of time that goes from zero to one. So let's see. Let's go to let's go to MathCat and find out whether how this works. Now 
just go up to the beginning of the spreadsheet. And this is lecture 21, and we're looking at the double kill function for left ventricular elastins. Okay. Um, I am setting the origin to 1, although that's irrelevant here because I'm not doing any um, any particular uh, solution of any circuit. We're just basically modeling these, this compliance CLV through the elastins of the left ventricle, which we'll later use in a simplified model of the cardiovascular circuit that has no pump, just basically one driven by, by these particular compliance. All right, so let's start with a healthy person with the E max is equal to two and uh, E min is equal to 0 0.06, so a healthy adult. And let's say this person is at rest, so the heart rate is 60. Um, so the period of the uh, cardiac cycle is exactly one second, 60 divided by the heart rate. The shifted period T max is again 0 0.2 plus 0 0.15 times the period TC, the heart, rate, heart cycle duration, and 0 0.35. Again, don't read anything into this. It's just a way to actually uh, compress this information so that it works within this particular equation. The normalized time TN is equal to the physical time T divided by the shifted uh, period T max. So that's what I'm using here in the formula of the double heel function. The double heel function produces this normalized elastance, it's a function of time, which is 1.55 times T over T max, that's, that's Tn, that's the normalized time, okay? The nor normalized or non-dimensional time is Tn, but I'm ex explicitly and directly stating this is a T over T max, divided by 0 0.7 to the power of 1.9, all of that divided by 1 plus that same factor, T over T max divided by 0 0.7 to the power of 1.9. All of that multiplying 1 plus or 1 divided by 1 plus t over t max, that's a normalized time, divided by 1.17 to the power of 21.9. All right. Then we take this normalized elastance function, which is a function that was from 0 to 1, and we explode at 1, or we explode it up to the range between e max and e min. And we do so by this basic linear scaling. E max minus E min, that's the span, times the normalized elastance plus E min. So let's see. Now let's plot this, what the elastance of the left ventricle will do from zero to TC, which is the actual uh, period or heart cycle duration, in steps of a millisecond. So we're going to go and plot these, and this is what the elastance of the left ventricle will look like. So as you can see, the elastance goes up very quickly at about 0 0.30 some seconds of this hard duration. We'll have systole, and then it will drop down and stay at rest for the rest of the cycle. So as you can see, systole occupies about one third, and diastole occupies about two thirds of the, of the cycle from the moment the pressure or the elastance starts going down. And more importantly, we know that the compliance of the left ventricle is the inverse of these elastins. So let's plot the compliance of the left ventricle. So as you can see, the compliance of the left ventricle is no longer a constant value as, as we've used compliances or capacitors throughout or, a, or, or all of our illustrations of cardiovascular circuits. So now it's something that actually changes significantly several orders of magnitude or more, more than one order of magnitude, from something like 16 or so to something less than one. So it's a couple of order of magnitude change in the value of the compliance of the left ventricle, which is expected to do what the ventricle would do, produce a pressure signal that looks like the pressure signal obtained by catheterized information or data, and it actually models what the cardiovascular circle or, or models what the left ventricle what left ventricle would do, and whose pressure signal will depend not only on what the ventricle is doing, but also on what all the resistances, inductances, and compliances after this uh, ventricle are actually uh, are actually doing. All right. Now, in our formulation, if we go back to um, our notes. Remember that this equation. It's the equation, the Faraday equation for the 
for the capacitor. If we exploded that equation using chain rule, we ended up with a state equation, or the equation for the state variable PLV, that depend on things like this, like the inverse of the compliance, which is the elastance, but also depended on the derivative of the compliance as a function of time. Okay, so let's evaluate what that particular function looks like, because we're going to need it for the solution of our, of our equations. So the derivative of the compliance, we define it as the derivative of C with respect to time. And let's see what that function looks like. So actually, the derivative of the compliance divided by the compliance, the negative of it, which is what's in the notes as the uh, term that multiplies the pressure on the right-hand side of the state equation, looks like this. Looks like something that goes up um, to about 30 uh, for a healthy person, and then it goes negative to about minus 30, depending on the position in the cycle. So it's something that varies quite significantly during the time when the compliance is a constant, as expected, this number actually goes to zero. Okay, because the derivative of a constant is zero. But throughout the rest, or the majority of the cycle, more than half the cycle, there's a significant amount of contribution from that term into the state system of equations. And that is what's going to produce the pumping effect of the ventricle uh, into the system, into the cardiovascular system. One thing to note that is very important is that since this equation is completely made up to curve fit, to match the data using fine-tuned parameters, we have to be careful when we evaluate it. One of the things to be careful about is when we evaluate the derivative of this function at time equals zero, we'll get a, a complex number. This is a, an imaginary number. So we have to be careful when evaluating this. Um, if you take the derivative of these at time equals zero, you get a, a not a number. In this case, a MathCAD is able to produce a, an imaginary number, but a regular calculator and perhaps a computer will actually crash, giving you something that is not a number, something that uh, is infinity to the computer itself. Okay, so that's something that we need to take care of. So let's see what happens. Let's move these things around. And let's see what happens when we when we actually change a couple things here. Well, let's see if if we make this patient have a little hard problem, right? So E max is 1.5. And obviously the maximum elastance now will go to 1.5 after scaling up from the normalized one. That's pretty simple. The compliance will be stiffer. So the heart is now stiffer. It's not able to actually produce what it needs to. And it's not actually to move the same amount of blood as it needs to. And you'll see that you can guess that from these values, but you'll explicitly see that next uh, lecture when we actually put this inside a circuit and see what kind of pressures and flows we get when we modify these numbers. So let's bring that back to two and see what happens when, for example, this person increases the level of activity to, let's say, 90. So now this person is walking, okay, instead of just resting. So now the heart cycle is two-thirds of a second, because the heart rate is 90 beats per minute. Then you shift it uh, heart cycle or period is 0 0.3. When we put this in the equations, notice now that the curve actually stops at 0 0.667 seconds where it's supposed to stop. More importantly, what happens here is that let's actually move this to, okay, let's move these to TC. Okay, so you can see the whole, the whole thing. Um, more importantly, look where systole occurs. Systole occurs now about a 0 0.3, which is almost halfway through the cycle. So no longer systole occupies one third of the cycle and diastole occupies two thirds of the cycle. Now systole occupies about, let's say, 45% of the cycle, while diastole occupies about 55% of the cycle. That means that the ventricle has a lot less time to rest until the next, cycle, the next cycle. If we, if this person starts walk, uh, running, now the heart rate is 120. The cycle only lasts 0 0.5 seconds. The shifted cycle is 2 point, 0 0.275. And when we plot this, notice that now the systole occurs all the way up to 0 0.27, 0 0.28 seconds. So about 55% of the cycle now is occupied by systole, by increasing pressure within the ventricle. Well, about 45% or less of the cycle is actually occupied in resting and diastole, isobulimic relaxation. So the heart actually has 
not only needs to pump more blood, but it also has a lot less time to rest until it pumps again. Okay. And all these numbers actually look quite different. And but more importantly, again, these are elastances and compliances and the derivative of the compliance. More importantly, you'll see these numbers in the next lecture actually representing what they are, actually being part of the state system of equations and delivering pressure and flow into the system. And you'll see what the pressure signal looks like and you'll see what the uh, flow signals look like. And uh, not only uh, introducing this particular compliance as a way to drive the, the circuit, but also, um, let me go back to the camera, but also uh, we're going to actually introduce some elements into the cardiovascular circuit to uh, come up with what we call a simplified model of the cardiovascular system. One that with the minimum possible number of state variables can represent uh, the full cardiovascular circuit of a person, including the ventricle, the atrium, or one of the ventricles, one of the atrium, uh, one of the atria, um, the valves, that separate the ventricle and the atrium and the valve to separate the ventricle from the aorta and uh, and the different resistances and uh, inductances that represent the uh, vascular resistance and inertia in the flow field. So with these, um, I'll leave you until next lecture and I'll post these notes along with this video and this MathCAD spreadsheet on Canvas. Uh, so goodbye, see you next time.